So yeah, good morning everybody. Welcome to RustConf. How many of you is at your first RustConf? That is amazing and wonderful. Welcome. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Um, I'm always surprised by the number, like every year it gets to be more and more people, which you think as a conference would go on, it would be less and less, but we're clearly like growing and that's super, super exciting. So uh, yeah. Um, I, saw, I saw this tweet yesterday and <laughs> I, I, I am not the CEO of Rust, nor am I here to tell you that we've removed string. But I thought this was really funny and interesting, um, not just because it's like a very good tweet, but I think it also got to a little bit of what we're going like, to talk about here today, which is like there is a fundamental difference about Rust and RustConf because we don't have the same degree of like, top-down-ness that a lot of other like projects and like companies have. Even though we're giving the core team keynote, a lot of this is kind of about like your role in leadership, not like our roles as to what's going on. So this is like funny, but I think also very insightful. Um, so for some backgrounds, uh, a little bit about the both of us. Um, I'm Steve, and uh, before Rust, I did Ruby and Ruby on Rails stuff a long time ago, and that was really great. Um, I started writing Rust in 2012, so I'm one of the older folks around here. Um, I joined the core team in 2014, um, and I'm the co-author of the Rust programming language. Um, so that's pretty cool. It took me a very long time, uh, and Carol and I worked really hard on it, but I'm super, super proud. Um, the most thing you need to know about me is I tweet far too much, and so uh, not only did I tweet too much on my personal account, but I'm also Rust Lang on Twitter, but like, don't tell anyone that. Uh, other people on the team have access to and tweet sometimes, but most of the time, like, that's, that's me. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so hi, I'm Florian. This is actually my first time to the Yes, and this is also my first time uh, running, uh, giving a keynote. And that's quite funny because I have replaced tweeting by running events. Uh, I run meetups, like the Rust meetup that I founded in Berlin alone has over 100 events. Um, we're doing that together as a team, obviously. Um, I'm, my path into Rust was, or into the Rust project, was getting, becoming a community team member in 2015 on the invitation of Steve and now being an observer to core, uh, which is like the path to joining core since this year. And I spent the time training Rust and forming a company around it. And the fun thing was giving my first keynote on stage with Steve is Steve's first keynote was on Eurocamp 2012, which was the first conference I ran. So <laughs> kind of there's a history. You got a long there. history. Yes. So let's get started with the interesting stuff. Is yeah. It? Um, so first thing we wanted to do is uh, recap uh, what's like gone on this year. There's been a lot of stuff happening in Rust world, and it's really easy when you like pay attention to every single release that happens to not like take a step back and look at just like how much stuff we actually like accomplished. Um, and so yeah, there's some some achievements. Yeah, Microsoft is sponsoring. So yeah, this is the, this is the sponsor <laughs> slide. This is the sponsor um, slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so first of all, the developer survey in Stack Overflow, we've won for the third time in a row as the language that people want, uh, want to make. And we actually got a little bit like, better in our numbers over the yeah. last year. Yeah, so one interesting thing, the, specifically what this is, is uh, the most loved programming language. And what that means is people that are using it today that want to keep using it in the future. And so when you're a young, small language, that's really easy, because the only people that use it are the people that love it. Um, so the measure of success for a programming language is really when people who don't love it are forced to use it at their jobs, right? <laughs> so pe people would always say, like, oh yeah, Rust won this a couple years in a row, but that's because like, you know, no one uses it, so it's fine. But this year, we actually got more loved. Like, that number increased as the community grew. So, uh, you know, surveys are, like, kind of silly or whatever. But, like, it looks nice, whatever. I'll put it on a slide anyway. Um. Then if surveys are silly, competitions. Um, there's the yearly ICFP, International Conference for Functional Programming, contest where everyone can enter. And it's a reasonably hard contest to enter. And there's always one winner every year. And they call the language that wins the language for, of choice for discriminating hackers. And we've won that this year and the year before. And last year both, yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Conferences, my lifeblood. So last year, we had three conference brands. Um, there was RustConf, 
obviously. There's Rust Belt Rust, um, which is the tiny conference in the Rust Belt, which I heard is awesome that I was not able to visit, sadly. Yeah. And in Europe, we've got Rust Fest. But since last year, we actually gained seven new conferences, Rust Rush, one in Asia, um, Colorado Gold Rust, great pun, <laughs> Rust Latam in Montevideo, also a great conference, the organizers around here. Uh, Rust Tokyo is coming up. There was oxidized conf conf uh, a conference focused on just embedded development in Rust, and another one in Europe, Rust Lab, Italy. So that's a total. From, we went from three conferences to 10, and those are all conferences that will probably repeat. So actually, I love conference organizers. Can you all give them a huge applause? Yeah. <laughs> Up until this year, I had physically attended every single Rust conference that had happened, and this year was the year that broke me, and I finally could not go to actually all of them. So that's a measure of success as well, I, I take it. Also, a tiny secret behind all of those, most of them are run by old Rubyists. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, all right, so this is and, usually, yeah. And Berlin, we have Rustbridge, the events that run around the, uh, the conferences that are trying to get more marginalized people into Rust. And the Berlin chapter of the Rust community has actually started its own local Rust Bridge chapter to continuously run those events in the city. And they have just formed two days ago. So it would also be great to give a huge round of applause yeah, to them. Yeah, brand new. <laughs> More celebration. There's the weekly newsletter, This Week in Rust. And they have probably picked this week specifically six <laughs> years ago to release number 300 this Tuesday. Also, yeah. huge round of applause to them. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge effort, and it's amazing how well they managed to really release that every week and make sure it runs, even when we had, even when the language was very, very young and volatile. Um, they've been with us for, yeah. This is ages. basically your one stop shop to learn everything that's going on in the Rust world. And there's no comments, so people aren't arguing with each other. Uh, that's great. <laughs> Any web page without comments is better than a web page with comments. Um, so, uh, another huge thing that happened this year that is like in the past, like, we're. When we talk about this year, we mean like from August to August, not like you know 2019 or whatever, to be clear. Uh, Rust 2018 finally shipped uh, in December, which was a super huge effort amongst the entire project from a lot of people, and it took a lot of work. And so um, we're really happy and excited that, uh, that that's a thing that was successful. Um, you know, up until the last second, you're always like, oh, is this actually happening? And then, you know, it, it finally actually happens. So that's really cool. So uh, we did it. Um, <laughs> and to talk about that like it's one thing, but actually it was like a lot of stuff. Um, so as a small example of the number of things that we ended up actually shipping, there's the brand new module system, um, infiltrate in all the places, the Dyn keyword to make dynamic dispatch a little more obvious to people, non-lexical lifetimes, which basically means Rust complains at me less, um, <laughs> default match bindings, which is one of my favorite features, never write the ref keyword ever again. Uh, more lifetime elision and inference, actually. I had to remove the advanced lifetimes chapter of the book because all my examples no longer needed the syntax that it showed off. The compiler just infers it now, so that's cool. Um, it does mean I get bugs filed now where people are like, wait, where did that syntax go? And I'm like, you don't need it anymore. Um, the, uh, the inclusive range operator, uh, dot, dot, equals, which took a really long time to, uh, surprisingly, you would think that inclusive range is not complicated, but programming language design is hard. Uh, SIMD happens, keeping up on our speed stuff. We got the, the beginnings of incremental compilation and uh, like global allocators and stuff, too. And this is obviously an extremely short list, uh, but like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happened recently, and it's been, uh, it's been great. Um, but more specifically, what you all want to hear about, I think, is that I bet you can't await for async await. Uh, 
originally sort of planned to be part of the 2018 edition shipping, but you know, here we are a little while later and it's taken a while, but that's because it's so good. Like good things just take time. Um, so more specifically, I don't know if you saw pull request 63209 happen recently, which also is an amazing like measure of how you know, active the Rust project is. Like we've had five digit numbers of pull requests, but uh, this actually merged a couple days ago. So this is now actually going to be stable sometime in the future. Uh, originally we were hoping to be like, it stabilized yesterday, we're on stage, woohoo! But now it's like, okay, you'll get it in like eight weeks or whatever. Um, so that's fine. It, it was is merged on Wednesday, so it was merged before the keynote. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what actually counts. Um, and it's also important, I think, there's been so much hype around async await to remember too, there's even more good stuff coming. This is like the MVP version of the feature. So um, the Lang team has been working super hard on this for a really long time, and uh, they definitely, I think, deserve a round of applause. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I think everyone knows how long async await took, but I don't think that most people actually know how long it took. So if you'll bear with me, I like to play amateur sort of Rust historian. Um, and so this sort of started, like and most people would cite, this is Aaron Turan's blog, um, Zero Cost Futures in Rust, um, and this kind of like announced the futures library. And if you notice, um, that was in August of 2016. So like it's been like three years. And what's sort of interesting too is at the end, they mentioned like async await as like, you know, oh, we're doing this futures thing, but like this is useful because of async await. And so most people would be like, wow, uh, it's taken since, since 2016 to ship this. And that's sort of true, but did you know that a long time ago, there were futures in the standard library? Um, in the sync package, uh, we had this, this future struct. This is a screenshot of Rust doc back in the 0 0.10 days, but it goes even further back than that, actually. I did some digging, and uh, in 0 0.5, which incidentally um, is one of the first versions of Rust that I ever used, this says July 3rd, 2013, but it definitely released earlier than that, actually. Who knows, GitHub metadata, I think we may have tagged it a little late or something. But um, here's what Rust code looked like back then. This is sort of a little small maybe on this slide, so you might want to check it out later, but this is actually an example of the pull the stuff out of the future um, code. The first thing I want you to notice is this, uh, the return type is ampersand self slash A. <laughs> a long time ago, that's the one of the syntaxes that we tried to use for lifetimes. So if you hate the syntax for lifetimes, think of this as better or worse. Uh, maybe you like it, I don't know. Um, there's also some other interesting things. You'll notice uh, in the middle of this match block, it says fail tilde, quote, recursive forcing of, forcing of future. This is two features that used to exist. The first is that panic used to be called fail um, way back when. And this is near and dear to me because I actually submitted the pull request to rename it. And then I wrote a script on GitHub to fork every Rust project and send them a pull request saying, hey, sorry, I broke your code, but here's a PR to update it to panic instead. Um, <laughs> So that was cool. And then the squiggly, like this is basically the dot two string of the day. So there was syntax for own types and it used the squiggle. So that's kind of cool. Lastly, right above this bottom uh, match block, self.state and then like bracket dash bracket state, mem swap had syntax in the language at the time, which is pretty cool. Um, so it turns out that like this has been in the making for like a very, very, very long time, not just like the most recent efforts, which obviously are also Herculean, but like it just it takes a really long time to make great features. And async await is like super fantastic in Rust, especially because we have one of the most performance and like interesting implementations of the idea that has existed. Um, this is sort of a field report recently from the Libra folks, so Facebook's cryptocurrency shenanigans. Um, if, you, uh, if you look at uh, their like, forum, basically, uh, this is a post they made, which is really fantastic. They've been using async await since, I think, roughly the start of the year. Um, and I'm not going to read all the shenanigans to you. I just want to mostly put that up there. But um, the reason that they said async await is awesome, and if you haven't like, heard of async await or if you haven't been doing async stuff in Rust, I want to sort of briefly explain. Like, a lot of people don't understand why it's so deeply desired. They're like, we already have futures in async. Like, what's the big deal? 
And usually that's said by people who have not written a ton of async code. Because like futures are great, but because the borrow checker does not understand the combinators of futures, you end up doing stuff like this. So here's an example of updating a hash map where you have to wrap it in an arc and a mutex. Um, and then for each uh, you know, future that comes down the stream, you have to like undo the lock uh, and deal with the ref counts, and then you do it again, and you have to unlock it here, and so there's all this overhead that doesn't actually need to be there. And so what this code turned into in their code base looks much more like this. So you have an async block, and then inside of it, you're able to call stream.next.await, and then just write your regular code. So there's no arc reference counting, there's no more mutex back and forth, you just write regular sort of Rust code with a couple uh, asyncs and await sprinkled in there, and you get you know, super, super powerful, um, fast code. So this has been like a really, really awesome um, thing, and people are definitely super excited about it. Um, and as an example of like, I mentioned this briefly a minute ago, but like one of the things that I think is really interesting and why async await is huge for Rust is because we are in a super, super fast at it. So all benchmarks are dumb, but this benchmarks looks good, and so I'm putting it on a slide anyway. Um, <laughs> Take this with a giant grain of salt because uh, C++ is actually coming for us, but on this benchmark, we still are the fastest by far. You notice Actix Core and Actix PG, both um, are the gold standards in this particular test, and the next best framework is at 65%, so it's like almost twice as fast as the next nearest one on this, uh, this particular benchmark. So the point is, is that like, it's super high performant and really easy to use, and uh, I'm definitely super, super excited about it. Um, so Although yeah. C++ is coming for us is a nice thing to say. Mm -hmm. After like three years of trying to be on the level play f uh, playing field with C and C++, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one last funny part about that before you know you get your next thing. I forgot. I want to make a slide about this, but I didn't do it. It's, you always think about things in the last second. Um, there's recently been a discussion. Rust 2018 has been successful enough. And, and like we modeled it after the way that Java and C++ do their compilation stuff, but there are now people trying to seriously propose that C++ adopts additions as a concept because they think it's been so successful for us and they want a way to advance their language forward without breaking old people's code. So I also just think that like that's a great impact that we've had is that like introducing interesting ideas to other languages and their ability to like do things. So that's also been, been super good. Um, sorry, anyway, for no. slide. <laughs> Take it home. It's also quite, quite fun that when we constructed this talk, because edition 2018 was a huge amount of labor and everyone came away exhausted. And so when we started constructing that keynote, it was a, a much more thoughtful and like focused on the things that went wrong um, thing. And when we actually started, like, hey, let's have a look at what we all achieved. Um, there was just a bigger pile of things that we wanted to talk about, um, giving it a lot more positive spin. Um, it's amazing for what the teams have done. So, also one thing that I forgot on the slides, the embedded working group has made embedded development on Rust stable last year, August, and since then it has been picking up usually, so we're now also in the embedded space as a newcomer, but yeah. Yeah, that's also very Huge good. Huge round of applause to them, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so let's talk about teams. Um, I just did a count this morning. Um, there's an, we have automated everything. There's now a repository, roslang slash team, where you can have a look at who's in which group, um, who has access to what, and who's officially in one of the many teams that we have. And Rust now has over 200 team members, making us one of the largest open source projects just focused on one product. Um, operating systems or uh, distributions are obviously larger where you have where they have this amount of maintainers just for small packages. Um, and this is missing some people that we want to onboard over the next weeks, like for example, a whole translation team. The Rust website now has six translations and more coming down the stream. And there's a huge amount of people working on them, and they're probably going to start working on the books and whatever later. So that's a huge thing. And the other count that I made is, how many people have actually contributed to one repository on github.com slash rustlang? This is including our fork of the yellow VM and jmalloc, just for, to make sure. I did. <laughs> Who else? Who's, who's got a p patch in somewhere? Yeah. yeah. Big hand for those people. But there's 5,400 oh. of you in the world somewhere. And that's awesome. That's great. 
And we're one, also there, one of the largest projects that we have around. And that's a huge amount of management. And, but yet, being part of the community team, the more and more I get the feeling that some people do contribute, but then never count it somewhere. Like they're running an event, um, they're running a meetup, they're running something they're teaching or whatever. And it becomes more and more of a problem. How do we give appropriate credit there? Or what do we even think is contribution to the Rust project? And you can put up a wide scope there. Um, because you got that, you did that 5400 by downloading the Git repos and looking at Git logs. But there are so many people that have done so much work that is so important to Rust and deserve to be thanked and recognized for it. And it's really hard when, like, we're used to making computers do the job, but we can't be like computer. Who has been all the organizing teams of all of the Rust conferences, right? Like that doesn't actually work. Um, and so this is a tough problem that we want to like tackle. In my personal model, actually, if we're a language that wants to be adopted, the reason why I joined the Rust project back then is because it always had the air of, we want to build something that people use. So if you want to be a project that's in the hands of people, just being at a company and or an open source project and telling people this would be something interesting to adopt and um, trying to get a raise adoption of the language is already contribution. We can't log that anywhere, or we, we, we never find a trace of that. So how do we make sure that people are aware that this is already something that we consider contribution? Um, probably even buying a ticket to this conference I would consider contribution. Um, it's a pretty wide scope. Um, and uh, actually a problem that is that comes up in practice. So I'm not just talking about like something that goes on in my mind, but something that we as a community team experience, um, that some people just feel like, hey, I actually invested time into this, but I don't feel like I get like at least the recognition back. And a lot of the recognition happens on the hallway here. So if you meet someone, um, consider like talking to them about what they were involved in and actually just saying thank you. That's a pretty big power move to say. I'm um, giving people the feeling that the work they have invested into the project there there around is, is really, really important. Um, because like I recently last week read a nice comment about why is Rust popular? Why do people take every announcement that the Rust project does and just put it out everywhere? And someone responded to that question with, it's built in large part by Mozilla, which enjoys special love as an open source company. Uh, that's actually quite interesting. People still perceive it like that. But even when we had Rust vs. Kiev, um, we, uh, the statistic was already like 75% of what's built on the Rust project is built by non mozillians We are incredibly good at having non mozilla contributions, um, not to diminish the value that Mozilla have brought to it. The second is Rust provides tangible benefits. It solves practical problems. But the third is, the community is nice and talented, so it's fun to see what they're up to. And that's all about you and not about us. This is nothing that any people that are on the teams or in core or whatever uh, have in any way done. It's the whole air around the community of being interested, being interested in adoption, being interested to try out new things, um, building awesome libraries. Blog posts, bad jokes. <laughs> like We all contribute in our own special ways. Uh, <laughs> More puns, please. Um, but that also brings a lot of organizational uh, challenges to the project, and that's becoming more and more problematic. Um, we need more people that do actually manage the project just to make sure that it stays in shape and that it stays running. So we need people who are not building new stuff, but making sure that stuff that exists remains in the state that it is. That also means we need to train up new people on managing. And that is one of the shifts that's happening this year. New people are stepping up. And one of the problems in there, are there, and this is where the community, it's important that the community stays kind about it, those people will fail at their tasks in different degrees, probably even hard. And it must be possible that they are allowed to do that um, because otherwise you don't learn. And the Rust project has people in team management that are 23-year-old students somewhere. That's an incredible chance. This is actually how I got into Ruby. I learned Ruby at the university, and the Ruby community was so kind to allow me to try out my stuff and just be bad at it. 
um, which I couldn't do at the university. And we as a community have the chance to give other people the ability to join the Rust project and be, have that experience um, for their own personal uh, lives. Yeah. And I think all this stuff ties in together. I've been thinking about this a lot, not just because we've had these challenges in Rust, but I actually became a product manager at my new job recently, and so I've been reading about management stuff. And a thing that I never thought about before, but a concept I came across when I was looking up, like, why do we call people staff engineers, is in, like, traditional management, there's this distinction between line employees and staff employees. And line employees are the people who, like, do the work that actually furthers the business. And staff employees are the people that do the work that keeps the organization going. And so open source has traditionally had a ton of, like, line folks, you know, like, sending in patches is very much like a furthering the goals of the language. But as we like grow open source projects into like larger organizations, we also need help from people doing all this sort of like support work in some sense. Uh, and like there's other like not not support in like a like helping users support, but like supporting the goals of the organization in a way that's not sending in patches. And like this is an area where we as a project are like a little deficient and are looking to sort of like improve. I am terrible at scheduling and running meetings. Don't tell the people who hired me as a manager. <laughs> Uh, but that's like a skill that's like important and needed in the Rust project, and so it's like a thing that I would like to work at because it's not it's something we need and I'm not good at. So it's you know, yeah. It goes further. Um, we're growing so fast that we regularly need to set up new working groups and structures. Last year we actually had to put in a moratorium on setting up new working groups because we just couldn't handle the load before edition 2018 to get new people um, on, and we're slowly starting to ramp that up again, but. It's still the people who currently are forwarding the language um, have to get that as a second task. Um, and so rearranging our project so this, that this becomes a constant task that we can help with is one of the challenges of this year. Also, because we've grown so big as a community and also as a, in usage, um, dealing with our legal framework has become an actual issue. This is something that, for reasons of this being legality, is mostly is hidden, but we need to talk to lawyers more. Um, and that's, um, that's, for example, something where it becomes problematic when someone is responsible for running Crates.io on the legal side, they can't be a volunteer. Because they really don't want to get a volunteer sued for. Um, yeah. for it, not replying on an email. It turns out the people that enforce laws don't care when you're like, sorry, this is my side project. I don't have time to like follow the law. <laughs> um, so it's like kind of important that we comply with those things. And like a lot of people and programmers don't think that open source has to like deal with legal a lot. But like you know, especially in running crates IO is like one of the bigger things right now. But like there will be other things in the future where you know dealing with lawyers is important, and that deserves to be like you know. Uh, work that is not just like whoever happens to have time on Saturday. Um, it's also very popular in open source communities that we only see coding as contribution, but the people who are dealing with that side are actually doing it. Like making sure that we can sleep well is is great. Um, but we haven't still, and that's our task for next year. We haven't found a cadence there. Um, we have definitely committed the error, for example, setting up a working group before summer, then to just figure out that everyone actually wants to go on holidays. And that's a very bad time. So people didn't attend any kind of meetings because for good reasons, I'm on holidays, I got family time. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, autumn next. Um, so it's time to review and change our practices. And that review also needs feedback. So if someone's like, huh, I'm, I'm seeing something that could work better, or if you have experience from another open source project where you know you've solved something, um, just be very open to talk to anyone who you know is on any of the teams and help yeah. them improve. A lot we of the reason why we're successful as we are is due to like our and other folks in Rust's history, specifically in Ruby, but also in other projects. Like the reason that Cargo is the way it is is because Yehuda had worked on Bundler and had learned what worked well and what didn't work well. And same thing with a lot of Crates.io stuff. And like a lot of the aspects um, are things that we've brought from things that we did before Rust. And you know, but we don't have experience everywhere. And so like, like we took the RFC process sort of from Python and their pet process is another like great example of a language influencing us. Um, and so, you know, if you work in a project and you have some stuff that works really well, like there's a lot of stuff that we don't do really well, and it would be great to figure out someone who does and knows that answer so we can improve. Yeah. 
So, uh, and one thing that I would like to talk about um, from my experience is a lot of the problems that I see popping up everywhere around like people getting angry at the project or disgruntled are actually communication problems. And one of the things that we don't do uh, quite, quite as much is modeling what the communication of the West project is. And because we're growing, um, that constantly changes. So when I joined like the Rust like, ecosystem, it was basically 10 hackers somewhere and a couple of people around it. So you could just, on any kind of communication, assume that everyone had a full picture of what Rust currently was and was building nightly every five days and would just be OK with figuring out and the, the, what just broke and where they would find out what broke. And since then, that has been growing all the time. And yeah. just a couple of weeks ago, I read, read an interesting blog post about from the developer, developer relationship community, how, how they model um, communication with their communities. And what they're using is um, a model that they call orbits. So basically, you try to figure out, um, are there groups that orbit around our project, or around me personally, or around my working group? And how do I need to communicate with them? And the nice thing about this model is, it's actually not bad to be in orbit four. Orbit 4 basically says, I really don't care about what you're doing as long as my product works and my stuff builds and I know about all the important stuff that I need to know about what breaks and what not. Um, while Orbit 1 is, those are basically personal friends that I need to regularly talk to, and 2 and 3 are other ones. We probably would have a different kind of modeling there. But the important part is, the more and more we grow, the more and more we grow groups that need different kinds of communication. Some just need a change log. Others need very direct communication. And because of the size of our project, um, we're starting to be in an area where even communication between team members already has that notion where some people just want to be informed what a team does. Some people want to be consulted what a team does. For people that remember last year's keynote, uh, why wasn't I consulted is a huge problem. But also finding out why do people feel like they should be consulted and how can I make sure that I can find those people and um, arrange them properly in that model is very, very important. Yeah, and I think that something that's really tough about this is this is not work that you can do once because as we grow and change, these needs grow and change. And so like, uh, you know, you talked about the number of people being able to see things because the community is small. Um, but like if another way this manifests, for example, earlier I mentioned when I changed fail to panic and I, I wrote that script, I looked up everything on GitHub and I think it was like 65 projects on GitHub that happened to be uh, panicking basically. Uh, and so I was able to like send a PR to literally every person with like fairly minimal effort. As we've grown, you know, we developed Crater, which is like a super wonderful tool to be able to, you know, see like, oh, is this impact, like what is the impact of a particular change? And like, how is that going to affect the Rust world? Because for a long time, you know, we had basically like servo uh, and then like open source code, like other open source code that's like on crates.io because we didn't have a lot of adoption within companies. But now we've grown to the point where like Crater while it's still an amazing tool, can't actually like tell us what the real world impact of changes to the language are going to be because like we don't have access to say like Microsoft or Facebook's internal repositories where they're doing private you know code or whatever. And so the infra team has some ideas on how to work there, but like the point is if you had analyzed how that worked at any given point in the project's lifetime, like and you stuck with it the entire time, the, the situation has changed from out from underneath your feet. Um, and so we haven't needed to like think about these kind of per things before, but like as we grow, we'll need to continue reevaluating these kind of things. So I'm sure this is a theme that you'll see like in the future in general. That you know, as, as we grow, stuff changes and it's different. So you need to do different things. Uh, it seems very basic, but it's hard to actually internalize that that's true. Also, for some time, that just works organically. Um, one interesting experience I had over the last week: um, Aaron started um, writing a marketing handbook for Rust, like one and a half years ago or something like that. And that kind of dwindled away because people didn't have the time. But during the last three months, I had multiple people finding out that the shell of this book exists and asking us directly, hey, could I actually contribute to that? Could I like take all your experience and like, put it into that book? 
what, would you be up for an interview? Um, so even communicating, we, we've got interest in writing something. And my theory around this is the people that were doing marketing for us previously was a small enough group that we could just do that verbally. And now it's becoming more and more that, uh, uh, that we don't have the time anymore to actually talk to everyone who's interested in that. So we need to write it down. So writing down more is like, if you enjoy writing, please talk to us. We've got a lot of writing to do. Writing scales. It's wonderful. Um. <laughs> so, um, and the final thing I would like to talk about is guarantees versus quality. Rust gives, the project gives guarantees. Um, we've got tier one, tier two, tier three targets, for example, and we have some writing around what that means. Um, we got the language guarantees in itself, the stability guarantees that we have, our security policy and all of that. Um, but that's actually not what people like us for um, because guarantees are only the last line. And that's something that people often miss. What people enjoy Rust for is the quality that we constantly deliver. And that's actually higher than the guarantees that we have. For example, we have a couple of targets that are officially tier two. But people are using them because the experience for them is, oh, they're great, and we can use them. It's absolutely no problem. Um, it's just decline in quality is possible, and if you are not aggressive about keeping it up to the current state, and if you're not tracking what your current level of quality is, um, we might actually get down to, yeah, just reaching our guarantees. We could have put future 0.1 into the standard library immediately instead of making it a separate thing. And you know, I don't even know if async await would have been really possible actually uh, on top of that particular version of futures due to the changes that we had to make in the intermediate years. And so there's definitely this sort of like trap that we may fall into where there's pressure to ship things because we want to get stuff done and we want people to use it. But at the same time, like those three years of like pain of not having async await is also the reason that we have an extremely high quality world class implementation of that feature and figuring out where like what stuff is okay to ship a little bit earlier, and what stuff really needs to take time to polish is, is really important and difficult. Yeah, and it's really important to be honest and subtle around this. For example, just last week, the goal, the final goal for having async await in beta was the last beta release last week. And we didn't actually manage that for a number of reasons. People didn't figure out fast enough that um, it's probably going to be delayed, which meant we couldn't allocate enough resources to it because kind of the message got lost. Um, and in the end, the release team doing what was, in my opinion, the right decision, saying, hey, you know what? We're not going to rush in a feature last minute just because we wanted to have it out for 138. And that was a good decision. Um, it was a quality decision. But it's still important that we do call that um, a problem, like there have been issues in the process. It would have been quality-wise better if we actually hit the communicated deadline that people were expecting um, at the quality level that we wanted to. And the subtlety and honesty comes in at the moment where we need to take this event just neutrally and talk about, okay, ha could we have improved in a, and could we have improved our processes, or where are the flaws in our processes? to actually make sure that we could have caught that early and got it over the finish line on the date we wanted and the quality we wanted. Um, it's not about blaming anyone, the classic management thing. Um, it's not about the blame. It's about like figuring out, hey, why weren't we able to both reach our personal or our project goals and the quality goals that we, uh, that we want to um, push out to the community? And this also takes like a big back and forth between you all and the teams as well, right? Because it's like your goal to communicate to us what stuff that you want, and it's our job to make that happen. But that also requires some charitability on both ends whenever you ask for something that we feel is impossible, or when we ship something that's like a little later than maybe we originally said, right? So it's like a symbiotic, like work together kind of like situation. And that requires this kind of honesty and subtlety with each other um, so that, you know, there's not like a whole big animosity between everything about how stuff goes. Like I've worked in languages and ecosystems where the users of the language like hate the team that makes the language. And it's like not a great place to be in. Um, so we don't, we don't want that to happen with Rust. 
Also, that's, that's a fun thing that I experienced as a non-first um, non language English speaker. Um, a lot of these discussions need some intercultural understanding, especially coming from the Ruby world, where a lot of the maintainers of the, of the language are not the best English speakers. Um, like Trying to get on a discussion level where you do give people some slack for, oh, maybe they're not as good at speaking my native tongue as I am. So probably discussions, like I've seen a lot of discussions go wrong because someone was ignoring that the other person speaking actually wasn't good at the language that they were speaking in and misunderstanding their points. Yeah. So. Um, so as a conclusion, um, one thing that I always liked about the Rust project is it was pragmatic, active, and results-based. So pragmatic in the sense of we actually want to solve problems in the sense of we want to come up with an idea that solves problems in a short to medium run. We're not aiming for the moon of like in 20 years, we've, we're building a research language that in 20 years might be picked up. Rust was always the language that would take the languages from the 90s, pick up their ideas, reintegrate them, and actually give it to people. And it was also always an active project. It is incredibly geared by um, what are actual problems that our users have, how can we solve them, and how can we integrate that into a good whole. Um, like the whole features story from like five, six, seven years ago is, a, is an instance of that. How can we take this idea and actually turn it into something that is usable and productive for people? It might take five years or it might take just two weeks. Um, and that we're always trying to figure out what, the, the, what those are and that we are actively trying to figure out what the issues are and asking people. One thing that I always also enjoyed about the Rust project is how open we were to go to companies and say, hey, you know what, you're using our language. Could you tell us what your current problems with it are so that we are more informed on what we actually should solve? And the last thing is I find it incredibly inter uh, important to actually check if something that we have done has given us the results um, that we wanted. And there's certainly things that we have introduced in the last two years that, for example, people just don't use. These, we thought that they would do it. It's not like we got a huge track record, a track record of building stuff that people don't use, but it has happened. Yep. There's some level of Rust maturity as like our mistakes accrue. Like I, at 1.0, I was like, everything's great. We've made no mistakes. Now I'm like, we have made some mistakes. Um, <laughs> but that's like a level of maturity, right? As that like, you know, you have to live with these mistakes and make the best of the future instead of, uh, you know, having these things happen. So, um, and yeah, as, as, a, as, a, as a final, final, final message, uh, we like in terms of the core team, but also the Rust teams need all of you who are maybe not on a team to help. And that doesn't mean like necessarily join the team, although obviously if that's a thing you want to do, that would be super fantastic. But like, you know, making sure to keep us accountable for the decisions that we're making and the path of the language, uh, you know, making sure to be empathetic about the fact that it's hard to do so, um, you know, like all sorts of different, like help running conferences, help teaching Rust to people, um, writing more libraries to put on crates.io. Like there are so many ways that you can help and we really want you to help us. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important. That's good closing. Sweet. Nothing to add. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.